the second half of our two-part interview with celebrated Hollywood science movie producer Linda Opst is coming up next on Science Goes to the Movies. I'm Faith Saley, and welcome to Science Goes to the Movies. We're back with the second half of an amazing interview with Hollywood legend Linda Opst, producer of Interstellar, Sleepless in Seattle, and Contact, to name a few. In our last episode, Opst was telling us about the development hell she went through creating Interstellar. And as we ran out of time, she had just lost Steven Spielberg as her director. And now we're back with the rest of the story on Science Goes to the Movies. So I lost Steven, and then I got a call from Chris Nolan's agent, who is the only director who could have replaced Steven. Mm. And he said, Chris likes this movie, he's going to do it. Which was quite wonderful, but he had two movie, one movie to finish, he was in the middle of one movie, and he had, he was in the middle of Batman, and he had The Dark Knight Rising to do after. But then he would do it. So on the one hand, it was a go picture, with a great director that thrilled the studio. And on the other hand, that was three more years. Mm -hmm. So he, we had- Gosh, it's like the plot of Interstellar, time like- Expands. <laughs> time expands <laughs> and, and contracts. contracts, right. And you just want to make sure your actors don't age, right? Exactly. Right. <laughs> Faith, you're fabulous. <laughs> That's exactly right. So send them out, so send them had out to the wormhole the two so they years stay looking, yeah. To develop this, yeah. right? To, to get it ready. Then we had the five years with Steven. And then we had the three that we had to wait for Chris. Oh. So on the one hand, it was in better shape. Do you see what I'm yes. saying? During the period of development hell. We were always with a great captain. Yeah. But we had to wait. It was just, it was hurry up and wait. I read somewhere that when you went in on the pitch with, with Kip Thorne, you, you guys to the studios, the, you had the real Stephen Hawking as a character in the film? That's my new movie. Oh, that's your new movie? You have Stephen Hawking as a character in your new movie. And a producing partner. Is Stephen Hawking going to play himself in your new movie? No. Did he audition to play himself and didn't get the part? <laughs> <laughs> what happened? <laughs> You're a tough cookie. There is a great item. <laughs> I want to see that on page six. So, so <laughs> Stephen Hawking auditions to play himself and himself. didn't get the part. And he's a producer. <laughs> so he rejected himself. <laughs> so he's a producer on this with you. Yes. He um, and, he and uh, Kip are executive producers of the movie. Are That's you, our new one. But we haven't him. really announced it yet. You've met him. You, oh, he's a dear friend. What is a meeting with Stephen Hawking like? Well, needless to say, I met him through Kip many years ago um, when he uh, could still speak. Um, and uh, my first meeting with him, we all went to Palomar for a picnic and it was quite wonderful. I'll tell you one, that, that's a phenomenal story. Although it's hard to tell you, how, to explain how long ago this was. But, um, so you know how long ago Kip and I met, it was about 70, nine or something. Wow. Well, it was around Cosmos, right? When Cosmos right. came out. So it was around then. Kip and, and introduced me to Stephen. We all went up to Palomar. And I was meeting Stephen. I was really excited. And I was trying to think of a question to ask him. Sure, right. And it sort of reminded me of this time my mother had told me about when she got to meet Bertrand Russell. And the whole time she was trying to think of like, should she call him Dr. Russell? Should she call him Professor Russell? Should she call him Lord Russell? And the whole time I was thinking, oh, this is just like with my mother. I have to think of a question to not seem completely stupid. And just as I was trying to think of a question, he asked me, 1979, what do What's I What's your sign? <laughs> what do I think of piracy? As, is it a problem? And I said, that's not a problem. Mm -hmm. I don't see any problem with piracy. Piracy of what? Piracy of movies? No. I mean, that's what he was asking about. Right. I, I don't see that as a problem. Right. And that's how 
much of the long chess game. Prescient, yeah. That's how prescient Stephen Hawking was in 1980, I guess it was. And I think of that all the time because years later, Peter Chernin said to me that piracy was going to destroy our business. Mm. And it was 15 years after Stephen Hawking asked me about it. And I keep thinking he must have thought I was the biggest idiot who ever <laughs> lived. But there were just no signs of it. I mean, they were just beginning to use the internet. So, um, and then I gave him over the years screenings, you know, whenever he came to town because it was so difficult to go to yeah. the movies. So we would get a little screening room and, and at my brother's agency, we would show whatever movie he wanted to see with whatever friends he wanted to, to meet. What do you know about gravity now that you didn't know before you began working on Interstellar? Well, that it creates warped spaces and warped spaces are the most interesting places in the universe. Why? because that's where anomalies occur, because that's where things are weird, because that's, yeah, <laughs> because that's where um, gravity exerts its greatest force and gravity is the most powerful. And uh, in warped spaces, in extremely warped spaces, we see the most um, um, bizarre, um, and interesting things in the universe. That's where gravitational waves will be coming from. That's where things like uh, black holes colliding can create huge effects in the, in the cosmos. Um, that's where dimensions can be warped inside one another. Um, so uh, the warped passages of the universe, uh, in the cosmos are the most exotic places uh, in the universe. The flatter the universe, the, the more expected, the more you can predict, predict exactly yeah. what you're going to find. You, um, you were a philosophy major, and, and Kip Thorne is an astrophysicist. Do you find that there are a lot of concepts and language that overlap from those two disciplines? Yes, well, I find that metaphysics is physics, right? The meta... Um, the way that um, the mind-body problem is now in neurology, mm. right? Mm. Almost 100%. Metaphysics is in quantum mechanics, right? Uh, what sorts of things are there is uh, ontology. It's one of the most important mm. questions in philosophy. Well, that's what we're doing at CERN. You know, at CERN, we're asking what sorts of things are there in the world? What are the constituent fundamental aspects, elements of nature, and then what are they made of, and then what are they made of, and then what are they made of? Is there anything more fundamental than a muon? Is a muon made of something? Is a scion made of something? And that's, that used to be ontology, and now it's particle yeah, it physics. it used to be all up here that's in our right. heads, and now it's all... And yeah. how do things work? What, what is... is we used to say, is, was there an ether, right? And now we're trying to find out what fields are, right? What, what composes the, uh, the, the, the element we live in, that we function in, the, uh, the very space that we, uh, uh, not just we, but that all the elements that compose us uh, function inside of. The whole nature of fields is probably, you know, made of strings, um, here's, maybe. <laughs> here's what strikes me as um, beautiful and fitting, that you th think about these things, know the people who work on these things, and produce stories. It's, when I saw Interstellar, it was so, in some ways disturbing, so moving, so beautiful, so gutting, because you're asking these fundamental questions, right, about like, what are we made of, and what's below that, and why are we here? But those are also like the poetic questions we ask about love and being human. And so in telling a story where you all were assiduous in staying true to the science, you were also, you were also exploring the most hu fun like fundamental human questions. Why do we love? For how long do we love? Whom do we love? Who are we and who do we grow to be? And it's amazing that you can tell those stories at the same time. Well, I think it's, uh, first of all, that's a testament to Chris. Okay. Um, obviously, I always want to tell very human stories because film is a very emotional medium. And it's incredibly hard to put 
one idea in a oh. movie. So the uh, father-daughter story uh, is very much Chris's um, overlay, mm. and that's very much his in his heart. Um, there was always an emotional through line, but the particular way that he worked the father-daughter story is very much Chris's gift to the movie. Um, but I think that there's way too often an assumption that if something is scientific, it's cold. Yeah. And that's just completely wrong. Yep. Scientists are among the warmest people I know. Uh, they're among the um, m people motivated by money l less than anyone that I know. They're motivated by curiosity. Uh, they're romantic for that reason. They're romantic about the biggest things you can be romantic yeah. about, yeah. getting the big answers. Yeah. Um, they're not motivated by prizes. They're not motivated by money. They're not motivated by competition. They're incredibly collegial. When Kip was working on LIGO, there was the possibility that another competing group had solved gravitational waves first, and he was thrilled and brought me to the lecture where those people were uh, explaining their findings. Wow. Uh, it's the most collegial, supportive community because together they're in search of the truth. How emotional is that? Right, there's an element of humility there. Of absolute humility. everybody's asking the same questions. That's exactly right. And so I find them um, humbling hmm. and humble. And those are qualities that uh, allow for love and uh, thrive in personal relations. That's also, uh, to, I'd like to add, a um, movie I'm most proud of uh, being able to make coming soon is about the love story between Carl Sagan and Anne Dran. Um, probably the greatest love story I was ever witness to. And he's among the most famous scientists we've ever had. So uh, when it comes to love and science, these two took took the prize. In Hello, He Lied, you, you talk about how you love the sociology of the business, and, and you often explain the movie industry in terms of alpha male behavior as if you're kind of some kind of like, you know, Margaret Mead in Hollywood or, or, or Jane Goodall or Diane Fossey, you know, looking at the hairy chest pounding studio heads. Um, so kind of putting on your pith helmet and, and binoculars, can you explain the lay of the land in Hollywood? Is it as much alpha male as ever? We still have our behemoths. Um, we still have some pretty powerful alpha men out there, but the behavior that made them um, Trumpish uh, when they were uh, has definitely diminished mm. because I think Hollywood changes faster than most places. Um, really? Well, Oscar so white turned in a year. Um, the women director situation, which was festering for years. We got sued by the ACLU, and I've never seen so many women directors hired uh, reactively in my life. So I think it's a very reactive business because it's so used to being reactive to the box office. Now, it makes a lot of mistakes, right? It always generalizes from the wrong principles about women's movies. It decides if a woman's movie works, that one of the women is a movie star, and it you know, as opposed to there's a big women's audience, right? Um, and, you know, there are still a couple of very powerful men that get away with very abusive behavior. But if a woman is very successful, um, you know, she gets uh, raises and bigger jobs. Um, nobody's patting you on the butt anymore like in the old days. Um, there's a real awareness um, of loudish behavior by and large, and um, I, I'm a little bit of Pollyanna in this situation because I was here for so long that I see the glass half full as opposed to half empty, yeah. half You've empty because it's better. Yeah. yeah. In, in your new TV series, Good Girls Revolt, it chronicles a newsroom circa 1969 into the 70s where the women make this revolutionary request, which is to be allowed to write. Mm -hmm. what, what drew you to the material? Well, I think in many ways, I thought my, I think my career in journalism is due to those women. 
um, they, uh, the, the women that sued for equal equality in the newsroom at Newsweek then inspired the suit at the Times and I got to the Times right after the suit and if it weren't for those women who were sidelined as a result of their winning suit I would not have had the career I had at the Times where they were so nice to me mm. and uh, when I read the material I realized oh, that's why those women were so unhappy I didn't even know that they were sidelined because of the suit. I sort of did, but I was dimly aware. Um, but I, so I very much wanted to honor them, and I very much wanted the new generation to know what everyone had gone through. And I think there's a wonderful dawning awareness on the younger generation that um, things are not equal, and there's still a lot more to do. I hope so. I hope so too. What is the dumbest? most shocking, offensive, ignorant, whatever is thing that anyone has ever said to you in your many years of questing to make a science film? Turned in a script, gave an idea, and somebody, you were just like, wow. Well, on Contact, this is very easy. On Contact, Peter Goober didn't want her searching for extraterrestrial life. He wanted her really searching for a baby. Are you serious? And he did two drafts trying to do that. Did Carl and Annie That's get that note? That's why they kicked us off. Yeah, we all knew we talk, we're talking about What's Carl Sagan's response when a production studio says, no, she's not looking for extraterrestrial life, she wants to be a mother? Well, that's why he brought other people on, because we were fighting him. We would fight him. Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, he thought it was unnatural for a woman to be looking for extraterrestrial life or oh. intelligent life that she should of course want a baby that's how backlashed he was oh my gosh you were looking for intelligent life in Hollywood production <laughs> yeah exactly um, what is what do you think is the best science film ever made you're allowed to say one of your own oh 2001 why it inspired me um, it had so much mystique it wasn't mystifying it had mystique mm. and it intrigue and it presented the future in the most inspiring, awe-inspiring way. It made you want the future to come. It made you want space travel. It made you want to travel the cosmos and think it was all possible. And, uh, and I think it was so ahead of its time in terms of AI. Um, I mean, I, I don't think an AI film has been done yet that was as sophisticated as it was. Um, I remember watching it the first night it came out and the, between the, the front row and the, on the floor, between the front row and the screen on 42nd Street, just mind boggled. I think it was 1969 or 1970. And um, I, th I think, I didn't know I wanted to be in movies, you know, I wanted to be a journalist only. But when I went into movies, it when I found myself in movies, I think it must have been some huge inspiration to me because it inspired me so profoundly. It, it, it just changed me so profoundly. Uh, here at Science Goes to the Movies, we like to ask people what their ideal, their perfect science, science fiction film would be, or science film. Um, you know, like, would they want to have Kip Thorne or maybe Stephen Hawking on board to get, you know, and get a big studio like DreamWorks? Um, how, uh, how close have you come to making your perf perfect science movie? Have you already made it or is, are you going to make it? I'm still making them. I'm doing that one <laughs> at Amblin. Yeah. <laughs> so is this your, is this your Carl Sagan and Anne? Nope. Movie? Those are two okay. different movies. Okay. Um, I don't know that there's a perfect one. I think you just keep trying to make them better and better. And um, will you tell us about what you're making? I'm not sure I'm allowed to. Oh, okay. You know how Stephen is. Ah, I, I mean, I know how Stephen is. Hold on, let me text him and find text out. Text him if you and could, see yeah. if it's okay. Um, okay, so there's an element. All right, well, that's a cliffhanger. Cliffhanger. That's good for the end of a show, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, we, had some, we had some scientists here talking about 
how much they appreciated contact and interstellar and how closely they hewed to, to real science. Um, but also how provocative they were when it came to, um, or, or compelling, um, to, to come to thinking about spirituality as well with science and, and one's faith and belief systems. Do you agree that, there, that in your films um, there is an intellectual as well as a spiritual storyline? Well, I, I certainly see how people see that. Um, Carl would have said about contact that he purposely wanted to juxtapose uh, Joss's point of view with Ellie's point of view because he loves that dialectic. He certainly would have wanted science to win, hmm. so he wasn't even-handed about that. Did Carl Sagan believe in any kind of God? Not at all. Okay. He was a confirmed materialist. Mm -hmm. He was not a deathbed confirmed mm -hmm. person. He was not a uh, um, person who thought maybe there was a marriage between these two things to be made. Right. We workshopped contact and interstellar. We copied how Carl set up the workshops mm -hmm. where we sit, brought in the best scientist in each area and then uh, for two weeks um, met with each scientist and each expert in the field and then had um, it all transcribed and the screenwriter Annie Carl and myself and George Miller who was then the director would listen and debate and just get completely full of all of the facts of the matter and we had theologians come in to be able to write Joss well. Carl knew more theology, more of the New Testament and the Old Testament than any of the theologians we brought in for the workshop. He was an, an autodidact and a, and a studier, the, uh, the likes of which I have never seen. Maybe Steven Weinberg was on the same scale. But he was brilliant about religion. Once he debated Marianne Williamson at my house and she was done with and done for, flat on the ground. Really? Flat on the ground. And, and she admitted it? She was like, I'm out? It, it, it wasn't a question of admitting. It was a question of picking her up off the floor and carrying oh, her out of the house. Or Marianne Williams. <laughs> I mean, Carl was the most educated, well-educated, and well-argued person I'd ever met. He could debate anybody on anything. He had so much more information at his disposal than anyone I'd ever met, I've ever met. So he, he was brilliant about this. And he wanted Joss to be brilliant. He felt mm. the better the argument on the other side, like Dostoevsky, like Brothers Karamazov, yes. the better the argument on the other side, the better the scientific argument could beat it. Yeah. So he didn't want to beat a bad argument. Yeah. He wanted to beat a great argument. He wanted the best possible argument for God and then to beat it. And then he would always say, your God is so small if it can't accept science this big. That was his favorite argument. Do you know? Um, now, Interstellar is slightly different because uh, Chris did the last rewrite, right? And because I think the... And some people have really interpreted Interstellar, which I learned afterwards, as a Christian parable. That was not your intent, I take it. That was not our intent, but I've come to see how some churches interpret the re, uh, his, um, his coming back as mm. a rebirth, yeah. as a Christian rebirth. Yeah. And, I, and it was explained to me, and I was like, well, smack my knee. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, I'm a Saganite, <laughs> so <laughs> you can Confirmed. trust that I did not see that. I'm not, sh I don't think that Chris saw that. I know in working out the field theory stuff at the end with Kip, Kip didn't see that because Kip is as much as a secularist as Carl was. But I think what happens is that when you broach these ultimate subjects, A, there's a tremendous amount of projection on these images. And B, there's a tremendous amount of profundity that just comes with the territory. Yeah. And living inside that profundity is thousands of years of sort of matching spiritual analogy. Do you know the Hindus came up with the bouncing universe? 
and they were right. It might be a bouncing universe. So very often, um, creation myths and cosmology match because our greatest minds may not have had the data, but yeah. they may have had the imagination. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so that's what I think sometimes you can find in the imagery, um, classic biblical imagery, as the Christians did in Interstellar. Or you can find a symmetry in what Joss and Ellie are saying that Carl may have not intended. And I feel that movies are open to interpretation. Right. It doesn't matter what Carl thought. It's a work of art. It's a work take, of art. Take exactly from the painting right. what you will, yeah. Thank you so much for, for fighting the good fight and, and bringing these real stories of science that, that we agree are, are so mind-blowing. So mind-blowing. Thank you for bringing them to all it's of us. It's so what I live for. Thank, thank you. And thank you for being here today. Thank you. You can find out more about this and other subjects on our Science Goes to the Movies Facebook page. And if you want to watch past episodes, check us out at www.cuny.tv under the Science tab.